Um, so again, my name is Kara Carroll. Um, I, along with, uh, we'll, go, we'll go and just say a quick hi of why we're up here, but um, Luce and I are here um, as co-organizers of the Latino Techies uh, and Hackathon that we did. Um, yes, we are. Yes. <laughs> hi, I'm Shelly. I'm one of the members of the Hackathon team. Uh, I'm Noah, I guess also one of the members of the Hackathon team. <laughs> more. Alejandro, filling in for one of the members of the <laughs> hackathon team. Hey, I'm Henry, one of the members of the team. And Janet, also a member. <laughs> so we had a really awesome team here, and they won the hackathon. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, it happened in November of last year, and this is the second hackathon that we did. Um, this one we focused, as we mentioned, on housing. Um, and it went wonderfully. It was in Pilsen. Have everybody, everybody been to Pilsen? Pilsen, power to the people, okay. Um, so we, yeah, we had a really great time out there. It was a Saturday, we spent the whole day, so it wasn't like a whole, you know, huge weekend where everybody's like doing all the things for like 48 hours, it was just like a, like more like a 12 hours. So the amount of work that we did um, in that short span of time with the teams that we had um, you know, went a long way, I think, um, in terms of what can be done um, when we're thinking about housing and community development uh, and the intersection of technology with those, with those um, arenas that are really important to our communities. Oh, it's like loading. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to say anything yeah, else? Sure. Um, so before we start talking about uh, more specifics of the hackathon, I wanted to give you a super brief overview of what Latino Techies is. So Latino Techies is a community initiative of gozamos.com. Uh, gozamos, I'm just going to slide over here, sorry. Um, what I get for using so many pictures. So um, Gozamos uh, was founded seven years ago by Abraham Velasquez Teo. Anybody ever heard of Abraham? He was really big for a long time. There you go. <laughs> um, in Chicago. And um, he was a web developer, a Latino millennial who immigrated from Mexico City, grew up in uh, Lansing, Illinois, and actually in recent years went on and moved to San Francisco to work for Apple, and now he's at Dropbox. So one of the reasons that he created Gozamos is because at the time, seven years ago, he didn't really see a lot of diverse media targeting um, Latino millennials who prefer to, um, you know, who, who feel great connection to their culture but prefer to consume media in English. So that um, was one thing that uh, what was the goal of Gozamos. It's an online magazine focusing on Latino arts and activism, uh, the only one of its kind in Chicago. We're nonprofit and volunteer based, which means we're broke. <laughs> so the only reason that we've been able to survive seven years is because we have, uh, luckily, uh, dedicated individuals that produce content, video articles, uh, a, a great group of photographers as well. And uh, gozamos, um, you know, we don't want to uh, we don't want to just be keyboard warriors or have our words only live online. So one thing that's really important to us is making sure that there we go, making sure that um, our we put our words into action. So one of the ways that we do that is through a couple of community initiatives and through programming at our home base, Cultura and Pilsen. So um, Latino Techies is one of those community initiatives you know, uh, to do our part to diversify the tech industry. We want to bring technology into our communities, the communities we grew up in and live in. So um, we want to do that to accomplish three specific purposes. One is to empower the next generation of Latino techies. So we had the first bilingual tech days in Chicago where we had different um, activities to teach kids how to uh, code. Uh, we had v uh, activities with VR devices. Um, we had kids working with electrical circuits. We did a, a few of those in Pilsen, and we also were at the Chicago Southside Mini Maker Fair and at Chicago Geek Street. So another thing that's important to us is connecting Latinos across tech. 
So for example, we've had some meetups and we also had the Hola Google group of Latino employees over at Google come and talk about their experiences of how they got into tech uh, and what those experiences are like. And then another major um, goal of ours is to tackle community issues through technology. And we do that through our signature event, the Latino Hackathon. In 2015, we did one for Open Data Day, and then this past November, we did one that focused specifically on fair housing and community development. So Kara's gonna talk a bit more about that hackathon. Awesome, so I kind of talked a little bit about it already in that um, we uh, really wanted to focus on community development and housing. Uh, we had a few, uh, we reached out to various sectors of the community. So not only did we, uh, we typically with hackathons, you focus on, okay, well we need all these developers here and they, they're gonna build all the things, right? But no, we also need designers. We also need people in the community that know what's going on. We need organizers um, that are doing this work in the, um, in the housing, uh, in housing and, and community development. So we were very intentional about reaching out to all of these folks. We also would, wanted to make sure to reach out to data scientists, right? So we had all of these different sectors of, of folk that we knew needed to be uh, coming together to answer these um, these kinds of questions that we wanted to have answered um, and really allow people to expose each other to the kind of knowledge base that they had um, and you know the expertise that they had and, and build something amazing out of it. So uh, these were the sponsors that we had uh, working with us to make the hackathon happen. Uh, we really uh, appreciate their help with doing that. Um, and as I mentioned, the all day hackathon was in November of last year. We had a lot of people. Uh, we ended up, I think, with like 30, over 30, but like 35 or something like that. Um, housing advocates, artists, developers, et cetera. Um, and the goal, again, was to create something that really involved the kind of data sets and needs that uh, the, the community and housing development uh, organizers really were seeing that was a lack, uh, was lacking in, in the kind of work that they did. Um, and also from, from those of us who are um, trying to uh, do really do great work and, and highlight the kind of experience that we have as uh, developers and designers um, and really get to understand each other. What are, what are the actual actual um, issues going on and how can we uh, work together to make stuff happen. Um, and out of that, we had uh, three teams and the three teams that we had focused on, so this was all teamed up at the event. So sometimes you have things come up beforehand, but we all just had a really great discussion at the beginning about you know, what are the issues, what do people really want to uh, challenge themselves to build something around. Um, and the three teams uh, spoke to um, empowering tenants uh, through storytelling. So thinking about how we tell the story of uh, being a tenant and, and what that looks like. Um, especially in gentrified communities um, that we're dealing with uh, here in Chicago and, and beyond. Um, and the second team was Renter Power, which we have here, right? Yes, <laughs> I'm like, they're like, no, no. Um, and they're talking about open data and, and housing advocates and how those things kind of come together um, on a day-to-day -day basis and making that um, you know more empowering for everyone. Um, and then zoning uh, meetings and, and trying to organize the way that people are aware of and communicate that their attendance uh, for zoning meetings. We found a lot of really great information about um, what those processes are um, and how we can make them more accessible to, to people. So um, without further ado, we're going to hear from uh, the Renter Power team. They, uh, they ended up getting a $500 prize, um, and uh, it was comprised of Somos, Logan Square, and the Autonomous Tenants Union, two big organizations, or two big collectives that are doing really great work, um, and, and brought their expertise together to build a really great um, uh, solution. And they're going to talk a little bit more about that right now. Hi there. We're the team. Uh, we're missing one of our members, but actually two, and we have a replacement tonight. Um, but yeah, so this is our presentation. We are just going to go over the problem that we really sought to address, explain why it is a problem, um, explain what we did to tackle it, and what we want to do moving forward. We have a lot of great things that we want to grow from this, and we're hoping to attract people here. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, just curious, how many people are tenants in the room? A lot of people, okay. How many are landlords? <laughs> Just went. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so 
the problem that that we're facing uh, here, and why you know the problem that we brought up at the hackathon, you know, is based on some of these uh, facts here. So, 30,000 eviction lawsuits are filed uh, each year in Cook County, so that's Chicago and the surrounding suburbs. Um, <clears throat> almost half of the tenants uh, in eviction uh, who have eviction lawsuits don't go to court, so you know they get judgments and all this. 95% of the tenants who do go to court don't get an attorney. It's even worse, and so when they get there, uh, the judge is present, the landlord is present, a trial takes on average of 90 seconds. It's like, did you pay your rent? No, I'm giving you a week to move. And so a lot of, a lot of folks don't know their rights, they don't have a lot of information, and Cook County in particular does not have just cause eviction, uh, which we could talk about a little more. Basically, it's, it's uh, you know, there are other ordinances in other cities saying that uh, you should have a just cause to evict somebody, not just get them out just, just because, right? Um, and then Cook County also does not have uh, rent control. So I'm going to pass it on to uh, Noah. Um, yeah, so as uh, Alejo said that um, in Chicago there aren't laws that protect tenants from rent increases or evictions as a result of a landlord just choosing not to renew a lease. So in our context, context right now in Chicago, we have a major gentrification crisis um, where rents are increasing really rapidly, buildings are being flipped, people are getting pushed out. Um, so when there aren't strong rights to defend tenants, well, we have to get creative. And part of getting creative is getting all the information that you can. So these are some of the resources that we use. These are public databases that we use to get information that's strategic for tenants to use to defend themselves. Um, so some of the information that you can get um, are the individuals behind the limited liability corporation. Most property is owned as individual LLCs. Um, using public information, you can get the individuals behind that. You can find the total number of properties and addresses that a LLC, that a corporation owns. You can find all the lawsuits filed against the owner of a corporation or against that corporation. You can get a little clever and start to find who the main investors are in that corporation. You can see what code violations exist. Um, you can also find the ward and uh, all their information. So if any of y'all's brains are already ticking, you can probably think about how that information might be really strategic. One tactic that we use is we'll find all the uh, lawsuits that were filed against a corporation or a landlord, an unethical landlord, and we'll share that information with investors, contractors, and potential consumers. Um, other things we've done were to disincentivize investors. So we were able to get to a couple of friendly aldermen to send a letter to an investor saying that unless your client so the landlord negotiates with the tenants he's evicting, we will not look favorably upon future investments that you're doing in our wards. Um, we've also pushed the Department of Buildings to prosecute code violations, not just in the building where the landlord is conducting the evictions, but in all of the buildings they own. Um, we've also tried to organize tenants across a landlord's total portfolio. So those are just some a few of the tactics that we use that can be very effective with the information that we collect. Um, so, yeah, all of this information is available online, uh, but the problem is, is that it's kind of difficult to access. Some of the websites are kind of clunky, they're difficult to navigate, and a lot of them require specialized knowledge to access it. So you have to know what you're looking for, you have to know where you're looking for it, and oftentimes you have to reference different websites um, to get to get the certain information, to get a different piece of information, and then go back to the original website. So it's, it's a tedious process. It takes, what is it, hours, you guys say? Yeah, it takes days to find it. So what we, um, good, next slide. What really we wanted to do in this hackathon was to build a website that makes finding that easier. Um, originally our goal was to build an automated workflow that got all the websites to talk to each other. That was a little bit too large for the scope. We, after we kind of settled on what we were going to do and figuring out what the websites were. Uh, we only had about six hours, so we built this step-by-step uh, -step website that's a lot more tedious, but it walks you through how to, like what you want, you can pop it over here, email it to yourself, and then it has little information bubbles like, why do you need to know the PIN number? What is the PIN number? Why do you need to know this? Um, so that's what we ended up doing, but we wanna talk about what we wanna do going forward. Yeah, so the next step would be to actually uh, finish that worksheet website and actually make it more functional because unfortunately during the day, we were only able to complete a few of the steps um, 
uh, to run through the whole process. Um, so, and, and since then we've been working on getting some more of that information together, but we really need um, to kind of finish that up. Um, and you can go to the next one. Um, and then this is kind of like a mock-up of what it could look like, um, but where we're actually thinking that we would need some more user interface design and um, more of this uh, functionality to, to to work and to have the ability to print and email the worksheet um, and then kind of beef up that information section would be the next goal. And then we have another website we want to build. Hello, I'm Henry again. So uh, I work for Here Maps, and I'm a software developer making big data pipelines. So when I saw this problem, number one, it kind of struck a chord because I always see new buildings coming up all over Chicago and I have mixed feelings about it. Number two, I felt like my skills could be applied to this problem. So what I wanted to do is basically build an entire workflow for so someone like Noah doesn't have to go to a billion websites and collect all this information. From one click of a button, you should be able to get all this information from tenants easily. So it ended up being a very ambitious goal. Uh, we weren't able to even begin it. The biggest reason is most of these websites don't actually have REST APIs, so it's not easy to actually write a script to have all this be automated. There are workarounds of creating a, a scraper, web scraper. I'm not a web developer, so I'm not sure that's an option, but we need more web development help for that. Um, yeah, but in the end, once we have this workflow actually created, which that's still our goal, you would have something like this, where you put in something like an address or a renter's or a landlord's name, and all those data points would be popped up. That's our long-term ambitious goal. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, so what system did you use to build the website that you have right now? Um, actually, it's just real simple, HTML and CSS. And a, little, and a little Java, yeah. JavaScript. JavaScript, sorry. <laughs> Is it the hope of developing this website that it prevents the tenant from going to court and possibly scares off the, uh, uh, the uh, plaintiff? And uh, also, when it is in court, how do you see it actually winning? Uh, the uh, how the tenant is going to be able to strategically use the data or the information in order to defend themselves? So I think par part of uh, highlighting the problem initially is to give a, a broad picture of just how uh, structurally powerless a tenant is, especially in Chicago and Cook County, uh, especially when they don't know their rights, they don't know what they could do. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically to give an initial picture of just you know, tenants are not in a good situation in Chicago, even though there are some really strong tenant laws here. But if you don't know about them, then what are you going to do? Yeah, thank you. that's a good question. Another way to think about it is that when a landlord gives an eviction notice, they're essentially initiating a negotiation, like a business negotiation. They're saying, you have to leave in 30 days. Um, like any other negotiation, if you have leverage, that improves your negotiating leverage. So that improves the chance for a tenant to be able to say, Actually, I would like a new lease at the same level of rent, which we've been able to achieve using these tactics. But more often it says, well, like I can't, I can't move right now, so I'm going to use the information that we've collected to create strategic leverage for myself, my family, and my neighbors to improve upon those terms. So maybe instead of a month, I want six months. Maybe instead of 30 days, I want uh, moving expenses paid, right? It's both an opportunity to, like, to fight evictions on the individual level, but also improve people's quality of living. I don't know if that helps. Whatever happened to uh, rent strikes, and is there a possibility of banding together tenants from multiple buildings that a landlord might own? Uh, yeah, that's actually an intention of this, and I'm gonna let Noah talk on that. Um, also, if you have answers, Alejo. That's a really good question, so I think so there is something called a rent reduction letter in Chicago where you can reduce a portion of your rent if the landlord is not making repairs. But since the primary crisis right now in Chicago isn't conditions like it was in the 80s or 90s, landlords actually want you to not pay your rent. They're like, get the hell out. If you don't want to pay your rent, that's fine. Get the hell out. And since a lot of the companies like we're talking about, JAB Realty, Fishman, Silver Properties, 
Um, some of these bigger um, flats is another big one. You could strike one of their properties, but if 30 tenants aren't paying rent that they really want to kick out anyway, and they have 300 units, they're like, great, please go on strike. So it's not a bad idea, and there are strategic ways that you can do that. Um, it's just not something that's like an, an issue. It doesn't make sense. Well, we should talk about it after, if you want to. It's interesting. Very risky. Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I don't have much to add to that. I think that's, that's good. Uh, I have a okay. question. Um, so, uh, sort of building off that, it seems like you have all this data about um, the landlords, and you mentioned actually a few by name, right, that you maybe even think are, are problem landlords. It seems like there might be an opportunity to take this data and sort of identify those problem landlords. I think the city actually releases a data set of prob of like bad landlords that are on like the naughty list or whatever the city collects. Um, so it, have you have you looked at that data set or have you thought about you know corroborating that data set with your own data and maybe sort of using sort of the aggregate information that you have to sort of maybe target the more um, egregious offenders? Yeah. Can I speak first? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to point out that I don't think was highlighted um, that I learned about during the hackathon was a lot of tenants don't know who their landlord is in the first place. A lot of tenants don't have leases. A lot of landlords hide behind multiple LLCs, so they have no idea. So even if they, th they, they might think someone is their landlord, and they could look it up on, that, on a list like that, and then they actually don't know. So one of the goals of that is so people can actually track down through the different sources to get their landlord. Um, yeah, bouncing off what Shelly said, actually just like knowing who your landlord is, we've seen to be like a pretty impressive form of leverage. Some landlords will give a 30-day notice, then come back to the negotiating table after doing that once a tenant has reached out to them personally. So just finding out who's behind an LLC corporation can be really helpful. The bad landlords list you're talking about, and then this city attorney guy can correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, <laughs> I think it's just for landlords that have a lot of code violations. I don't think it's for landlords that carry out a lot of no-fault evictions. Um, so sort of along those lines, I'm curious if you guys have started or will be able to sort of track sort of uh, the rate of evictions in different parts of the city and compare them. And along with that, I'm curious if uh, eviction is the primary tool that's used to like foster gentrification in an area or if there's also just, if the landlord can just like raise your rent and yeah, so the initial statistic that, that we gave at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the majority of those folks uh, were being sued for eviction because they couldn't pay their rent because of some other crisis in their life. Um, but in terms of gentrification, yeah, I think you're, you're right. A lot of it happens by rising rents, but a lot of it also happens even before a lawsuit is filed. You give a 30-day notice um, to folks who just had month-to-month -month tenancies, and then uh, folks get really scared. And there are some landlords, some egregious ones, that use really uh, scary tactics like bringing their friend along, dressing up you know, as a cop or whatever, and saying, hey, you got to get out of here or I'm going to take your stuff out. Even though in Chicago, the only person that can lock you out of an apartment is the sheriff. And before that happens, you got to go through a court process. So a lot, of, a lot of folks get scared. They move before the 30 days is up. And I, a lot of it is due to lack of information. So I think that's uh, what we're trying to, to bring to the table here. Yeah, so there, in 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 a lot of cases, landlords, if they're paying attention to the population they're trying to evict, they will threaten them with uh, immigration raids. So. Um, one thing that we did had to con had to consider while building this is that if you're a renter, you may not want to have your information saved somewhere because of your citizenship status or something like that. So just something to, to consider that we wouldn't want to save like the data that people are pulling um, just, just to make the user feel comfortable in using the product. And someone had asked about data tracking and trying to notice patterns. Um, that is a big issue for that because one of the reasons so many people do not go to court is because they think court is linked to immigration court. So they will be reluctant to go to housing court, which is totally unrelated. Um, 
and then also back to the fear of being somehow connected and then tracked. This is such a great question. We all have something to say about it. So thank you for asking it. Um, one quick thing I wanted to mention is um, gentrification. Well, one of the reasons why we had focused specifically on fair housing and community development is because it's, um, gentrification is such a huge issue in Latino communities in Chicago from Pilsen to you know Humble Park um, to now even Little Village is starting um, to gentrify in the Marshall Square area. So that's a huge issue to the um, our readers of Gosamos. And then it actually uh, personally affected us this past July when um, we have our home base, Cultura and Pilsen, and we're currently homeless. <laughs> um, we're in res well, we're in residency at La Catrina Cafe. They've graciously gave us a space uh, temporarily. But the reason why we lost our home is because our landlord um, doubled our rent. And it was impossible for us as a nonprofit full of nonprofit organizations uh, to be able to pay rent. So definitely raising rents is one way that um, landlords, of course, try to change the neighborhood. Yeah, um, hi, this is David. Um, I had uh, another question about gentrification. Uh, it's, are you guys working on anything that's specifically uh, fighting against gentrification in communities or just focusing on uh, not getting people evicted or helping them through that process? Um, I'll just quickly answer, I think that the specific scope of the people here um, are, I think, tackling gentrification on in one front, and I think that there's opportunity for us as we have a group here um, with Shai Hack Night, and was, as we continue to plan out what we're doing um, throughout the year, I think that that's, that was a very um, important issue for us to, to continue uh, grappling with um, and defending uh, our communities. Uh, so I think that we're definitely gonna have things that come up. I think there were, there were other groups that were at the hackathon that wanted to um, address this issue. So I think that having the opportunity to work with people here um, and uh, continue to um, you know, build out the tools that, that we were really excited to, to do um, is, is going to uh, help answer that question for us. Uh, hello, assuming your website was ever fully completed uh, with everything you wanted to have, how would you make it accessible and well known to people who would actually use it? Um, I was talking to uh, someone today who's like, I think she's like a mother of three and has a newborn. And I was, she, just, she had just gotten a 30 day notice and we were trying to talk about the eviction court process. And I was like, do you have a computer? Because there's this website that's really helpful for tracking your eviction and um, sort of fighting it on your own even without a lawyer. And she was like, no, I don't have a computer. And I was like, do you have a smartphone? She's like, yeah, I have an iPhone. So I was like, cool, put your phone on speaker. And within like five minutes, I had shown her how to use, just over the phone, use the, uh, the web app to track your own eviction and told her everything she know, needed to know about fighting her own eviction. So even if people don't have access to like computer, basically everybody these days has smartphones. Um, so it can be really easy to just, just use your smartphone to find the strategic information you need. Is, is that relevant? The, the people that were involved, right, that was part of the reason why we wanted to have organizational support. We, we don't just want to build something like, hey, we're a techie person, we're building solutions, and we don't know any organizations that are also doing this work. Like, that is total fail for us. Um, so we were very intentional about that. So I think that part of the reason um, we, you know, part of how we would distribute this kind of information is, you know, firsthand reaching out and having people involved that are reaching out to people that need this every day on the daily basis, that's their job. So I think that that's, um, you know, like, uh, kind of like whatever the first point <laughs> of exposure would be um, the people. And and then obviously we have a really huge medium of Gosamos um, to be able to spread the word. I think that that's a really important um, uh, journalistic space that we have in the community and, and, and everybody's very connected in that way as well. So, yeah. I would particularly be uh, interested in chatting with anybody here that has experience creating APIs for websites that don't currently have APIs. Uh, specifically for websites that are, um, are they private or are they government owned? Or? Okay, yeah. Yeah, these are super like old, clunky websites that look like they were written for like 
a long time ago. So if you have any experience writing APIs for a website, let me know. Talk to me. And another thing is if anyone knows what's happening to the Cook County Recorder of Deeds, um, that's one of the main websites we're doing. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Just ti tiny antidote. I'll move this way as we do this. That happened the weekend, right? Elections happened that like just that week. So that weekend that we thought we were going to have all this data and access, we actually didn't because the recorder of deeds was like, well, my job is done. So I'm going to shut down my website. And we were like, no, we need all this data. And we didn't have it. It was kind of tragic for some of our uh, hackathon peeps. Great. Well, thank you so much.